So let me just share a little bit about Valerie for those who may not be as familiar. Valerie is the Sydney and Francis Lewis Family Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Prior to her position at the BMFA, she was Senior Curator at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. That was from 2000 to 2017. She has served as Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago before that, and as a Program Specialist for the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2000, she also served as one of six curators selected to organize the biennial for the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. During her time at CAM Houston, she organized a number of important and kind of field-defining exhibitions, including Double Consciousness, Black Conceptual Art Since 1970, Cinema Remixed and Reloaded, Black Women Artists, and The Moving Image Since 1970, which she co-organized with Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, as well as Radical Presence, Black Performance in Contemporary Art, which was from 2012. Her 2018 debut exhibition at the VMFA was the five-decade survey of work by Howardina Pendel, which was entitled Howardina Pendel, What Remains to be Seen. Since joining the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, she has also organized the exhibition Cosmologies from the Tree of Life, which featured over 30 newly acquired works from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, and I think we are certainly in store for a really illuminating and lively conversation between these two women. So join me in welcoming them to the stage. So many questions to ask you, Valerie, but just to kind of set the stage, this is an expansive exhibition. It occupies all three floors of MCA Denver and a sizable footprint in its original venue. MCA is the fourth venue. And um, the final venue. Yes. Yes, and the final And venue. the final, and yes. the final. Best for last, saving yes. the best for last. <laughs> um, uh, at the MCA, there are 60 artists and over 100 artworks. Um, so, in terms of opening the conversation, I would love to begin at the beginning mm -hmm. and have you share with us um, a bit about how you embarked upon this very expansive project and what were some of your early sources of inspiration. Okay. Well, first and foremost, thank you. Um, for the many conversations. This is our first public conversation, yes. but we've had many conversations over the last, well, we've known each other for a long time. So, mm -hmm. but uh, as it relates to this exhibition, certainly over the past year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very thankful to you and for Nora for having the vision to bring it uh, here to Denver. It uh, is an exhibition that had its genesis when I lived and worked in Houston. I worked at the Contemporary Arts Museum, which was a non-collecting institution, and was very curious. I think that's the beauty of the work that we do working mm -hmm. with contemporary artists, is you can pursue a curiosity and have that really manifest um, in, in various ways. So that curiosity really I uh, was became because going to various artist studios and seeing uh, what I felt was a newfound embrace of traditions coming out of the African American South, a sort of focus on assemblage sometimes, um, a real interest in uh, bringing soil into the work, an interest in looking at African American quilts and uh, textiles and things that really provoked ideas around Southern folkways and Southern traditions. And for me growing up, I grew up in Houston, I, there, was, um, there was really an otherness uh, in how people saw the South that was not always celebrated. Uh, and oftentimes it felt uh, almost as if one wanted to shy away from being Southern, you wanted to be quote unquote sophisticated, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't want to be from the South, that it was sort of marred with um, a moniker of sort of, sort of regressive, uh, regression. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to see this sort of newfound bravado around being Southern was very 
interesting to me and really trying to get at the heart as to what was driving this new new wave uh, for artists. And um, I think it was clear to point to Southern hip hop mm -hmm. as being an impetus to embrace one's Southerness mm -hmm. uh, and to understand uh, traditions that have been preserved and remained and have evolved over time as being um, traditions that had much to teach contemporary art and contemporary artists and contemporary society. Yeah, I love that you often point to this quote by Andre 3000, the South's got something to say. That's right. Um, and this signaling this turning point in terms of popular perception of what the South has to offer and what it could be. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think the artists felt that way and had felt that way for a long time, but finally had a, um, an avenue and a, and a, I'm not sure if I'm going to find the right word, um, felt that their, their feelings were, were valid and mm -hmm. they had now a new platform at which to stand to say this is a new South mm -hmm. that's fashioned from the old South uh, that carries with it the weight of all of the rootedness and groundedness and repository that have been left for it, a, a virtual storehouse, mm -hmm. you know, of things to pull from um, that were time tested and true that had remained uh, and when you stand on that kind of truth, you know, it's, it's unshakable. And there was just a real sense of ownership of that, which I loved. Yeah, so one of the, so the opening theme in the exhibition is that of landscape. And actually, I, I should say overall, there's this deep sense of rootedness um, that runs throughout the show. And there's a gorgeous Hundle uh, photograph called Roots that I love. Um, but I, I was wondering if we could talk about you, an artwork that you said played a pivotal influence on your thinking about the show, and it is in fact sort of the opening note or the opening salvo of the show, and that is Alison Janae Hamilton's Wachissa. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very intentional move by you, your part where when people enter the galleries, it's the first piece you encounter. Um, could you share a bit about how you decided to begin there? Uh, well, I met Allison uh, when she was an uh, artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And she was, uh, she's from Northern Florida and works a lot with a sort of notion of uh, spiritual constructs, haints, and this idea of ghostly presences that exist in the landscape. Um, and she had not only a series of photographs and series of sculptures, but she showed that particular video of, of uh, Wasissa, and it is a river in northern Florida, which uh, oftentimes is referred to as the slave canal because uh, people in bondage helped to dredge it further, you know, by hand, to open it and expand it and deepen it so that goods could travel um, across the river and, and, and for commercial purposes. And so uh, it had still this residual uh, energy around it. And that even in contemporary times, um, it was being used as a runoff for the turpentine factories. Mm -hmm. So you had this sort of um, language and concern around injustices that span the arc of time. Uh, but that was definitely about uh, place and about geography. But what I loved most about it was this um, sense of um, uh, disorientation that one, at one point, it's unclear uh, whether you're looking uh, up or down, uh, which way the camera is pointed, but then also a kind of spiritual arc. And that fed into that, this notion of disorientation, uh, but also water and what water, um, brings to mind what it evokes. It is a point of entry, certainly, for black bodies coming across the ocean, the Atlantic, and being transplanted into the United States. So that was one way. It was about the beginning of a journey. Um, but it was also how water still connected, and not only connected us to other land masses, 
connected us to Africa, but also connected us spiritually between the physical and the spiritual realms as well. Yes, and I should say there's a slide of uh, which is behind me, um, and it exemplifies how at the VMFA, mm -hmm. you entered the space, you saw Wachissa, you turned the corner, and sort of continued your way through landscape. And um, and you've talked about the theme of baptism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in association with, with with Wachissa. And so when you see this video, you're t it's like you're turned upside down, you're moving through the river, but your head is submerged. Sort of that moment of. Uh, you know, immersion in water. Exactly. And um, it's funny, we always draw from our own backgrounds. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I was raised Mexican Catholic, so it's, to me it was, I think, baptism, I think purging, but I, or like the purging of sins. Mm. Um, but I loved actually a quote you shared with me, the idea of preparing yourself. Like exactly. a baptism is an act of, it's a cleansing and it's a beginning, but it's also a preparation. It's true, it, it, it is to cleanse the spirit. I was raised Pentecostal. Uh, and so we know that we go to the river to be baptized. Uh, and it is an act of not only cleaning, but also preparing one for the, the new self, the, the re-emerged self. Uh, and so it is John the Baptist preparing the way before. Uh, and so it is about preparation to be prepared to, to embark upon a journey. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there is a very much a journey in the way the show is installed. It's sequential, the idea is that you follow a path. Um, but so much of the show is also about points of origin. And I think part of the experience of seeing this show and preparing yourself for the material and absorbing the material is acknowledging so many moments of origin in terms of American history, in terms of art history. Um, I mean, I think of like that, there's a Mildred Thompson wood picture where she's using found materials and uh, thinking of like narratives of American art history grounded in traditions that have nothing to do with New York, with traditional ways of teaching modernism um, and, uh, you know, basically shifting our lens mm -hmm. and what people can draw from that. Well, you know, there is a, such a thing. I, I, you know, my colleagues cringe when I said, I said, but there is such a thing as backyard modernism. I mean, we all have um, endeavored to trying to find um, original languages and or, uh, original um, creative expression that really encapsulate what it means to be wherever you are, uh, what mm -hmm. it means to be American, what is it, the American art form, mm -hmm. you know, what are certain um, original American expressions and art forms. And I always also say that if jazz is the original American music art form, what is the visual equivalent of that? I mean, you would find uh, improvisation, you find the level of structure, you find all of that in, in objects like the African American quilt. So I think instinctively uh, individuals like Alfred Barr, you know, who uh, was the founding director for the Museum of Modern Art, you know, clearly instinctively understood that there was an American utterance, a creative uh, visual language coming out of America. And that's why as early as 1937, there was an exhibition by William Edmondson, who was a stone carver uh, presented at MoMA. But it, it is that sense of, yes, looking at points of origins. And I always say, particularly when you're looking at the, the South, uh, the South is a point of origin for our contemporary society, American society today all of the um, uh, wonderful positive things and all of the things that still dog us that were problematic then are problematic still and it's just radiated outward, so. Yeah, well, and there's a piece that I think articulates that's that idea of origin so beautifully, the Kevin Sipp, uh, it's uh, Take It to the Bridge. Mm -hmm. There was a slide on view earlier, but it's essentially um, uh, African pot with a speaker, uh, mount, speak, uh, speaker box top mounted to it, and this incredible twinding uh, wooden uh, uh, branch connecting the, pot, the ceramic pot to a record player. Yeah, and it's actually the, the drum. It's an African drum. drum. The, I'm yeah, sorry, the drum. To be yes, the drum. thank you, yeah. yes. And, um, but basically drawing, um, making visually clear the importance of West African influence 
on how we think of American music. Absolutely. Yeah. And the tree, too, as a element of the land that also is a connective tissue, mm -hmm. whether it's um, connecting, um, in that sense, the bridge and being a sort of metaphor for connecting Africa and African uh, rhythmic sensibilities to uh, R&B or spirituals or other African-American musical genres. Um, there's also that connective tissue between the earth and the spirit world. I mean, so it, it, it conceptually uh, arcs in a couple of different ways. Yes, mm -hmm. and, um, and of course that title, Take It to the Bridge, um, is such an important refrain mm -hmm. in music. Yeah. And sound is such an impart, important part of this show overall. So like the sound of Washissa greets you as you enter the landscape section. Mm -hmm. The next section in the exhibition deals with spirituality, so sinners and saints. And um, you're greeted by the voice of Sister Gertrude Morgan and her artworks. But um, could you talk about that role of sound um, as you move throughout the exhibition and how you thought of it as a... Yeah. as a force. Well, all of the sound that is in the exhibition originates from objects in the exhibit. So it's not, um, it's not disconnected in any way from what it is that you're actually seeing. I would think probably the only exception is Sister Gertrude, which is a separate, um, um, it's, it's her album from 1975, Let's Make a Record. Um, but it, it plays in uh, the context of seeing her other um, objects, her works of art, um, the, the visual works of art, objects. But everything else is looking at the sonic as both something that drives you along the journey, um, but then also a tangible aspect of, of that journey. You know, the sonic as actually being uh, in, in inhabiting space. Um, it's a it's a vehicle. It's an agent, but it also um, it also surrounds you and it inhabits uh, and influences and impacts how you see. And it is a connective tissue. And that the sonic has been a, a connective tissue for uh, African American expression as it's evolved over time and o across geography as well. Yeah. And also, I mean, I have to say, when you're in that space, in the first room of Sinners and Saints, her voice has so much joy, you know. Um, she um, believed herself to be the bride of Christ, and that's the subject matter of her artwork. She was, um, she was a preacher. She had, um, she had the um, Everlasting Gospel Mission Chapel. And so spirituality is a powerful motivator in her work, as it is for quite a number of artists in that section. Right. Um, and spirituality, yeah. not just a, a kind of Christian sensibility, but understanding spirituality and all of its complexity. And I think that's one of the things I try to um, really make clear through the exhibition. Um, the initial iteration was 102 artists, 140 works of art. Uh, being intergenerational, uh, artists working in a variety of genres, artists who are academically trained, others who are not, but really bringing home the level of complexity that exists over time mm -hmm. and across geography, that the South was never seen as a monolith, was never really embraced as a monolith, mm -hmm. but yet from the outside looking in, there is a propensity to flatten it as a monolith. And so when you look at something like spirituality, you have to see it in all of its complexity. Mm -hmm. It's not just the South as the Bible belt, as a space of Christianity. There are syncretic religious practices. There are people who practice uh, naturalism, uh, other modes of spiritualism. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are reflected in the exhibit. Yes, absolutely. And I love, in our iteration, we have um, this juxtaposition of the Renee Stout. Um, she kept her conjuring table very neat, um, which I think really embodies that approach to uh, syncretic religion, mm -hmm. right next to um, the powerful uh, Rodney McMillan asterisk in the Dockery. Yes. Um, which is the room size installation in red leather of the interior of a, of, of a chapel. So there's that hybridity and that bringing together. 
And we should talk about the chapel because for many it's the most um, impactful work in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 you know, there's nothing like walking into a room of red vinyl to really provoke <laughs> a kind of visceral response. Uh, but it is, uh, it's called Asterix in the Dockery and it is uh, evoking or referencing uh, an actual space in Mississippi uh, in the Delta, um, the Dockery Farms. And the Dockery Farms were previously the Dockery Plantation. And after emancipation, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, tenant farmers that worked there, but there were uh, a lot of itinerant laborers that would come. And because it was located in the Delta, uh, you had a lot of itinerant musicians who were moving in and out, who were going from one gig to the next. Uh, people like Charlie Patton and Howling Wolf and Robert Johnson, uh, who you may know, you know, the, you know, the crossroads. Uh, and so in that respect, um, this sort of uh, convening, if you will, of all of this uh, amazing musical talent, uh, sometimes people's stays would overlap and they would uh, share um, in patterns and ways of singing and uh, playing with one another. And uh, because of that, it arguably became the birthplace of the blues. And so when you think of someone like Robert Johnson, and um, it's always understanding the blues in the context of the 30s uh, as the, the flip side of the sacred, you know, it was the profane. And it, either it was Christian music and it was done in um, the, um, in terms of the aesthetic of the, the, the spirit and of God, or it was the profane. It was considered the devil's music, right? And so Rodney wanted to kind of capitalize on this notion of the, this sort of uh, by, you know, um, this, this sort of line, this demarcation of uh, understanding the profane as the flip side of the sacred. And what he does is he combines it and then understands that there's a, a sacredness within the profane. There are points of origins within the profane, that it, there, is a, there is an ecstatic that comes out of it, mm -hmm. just as one has an ecstatic within the, the sort of religious um, uh, context as well. So it's just the flip side. Mm -hmm. So it is a hand-fashioned uh, recreation of a one-room chapel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just on view um, mm -hmm. behind me, yes. So you turn the corner from the, that room on spirituality and, and there's a powerful throne by Thornton Dial. And I wanna bring up Thornton Dial in part because I know you're very familiar with his practice because of your work with Souls Grown Deep. Um, and Thornton Dial is an artist that received um, a, a, a tremendous recognition towards the latter end of his life. Um, and uh, yet, that as, as a black artist working in the South, there's been this evolution of, and of terms ranging from folk to self-taught, but I've noticed you don't use those terms. I, I've heard you say non-academic, you know, and I think it's, um, to me, it feels like a fruitful time to sort of revisit these ideas, right, of how artists are framed. Absolutely, you know, I, um I think where I try to go, I don't really have, uh, I, I've tried various combinations of words to try to uh, embrace um, the practices of those individuals who are coming out of the African American South who are not academically trained. I think oftentimes when we say visionary artists, mm -hmm. folk artists, um, outsider artists, we are excising a certain kind of intellectualism that happens within these practices. And, you know, I don't know if it's a kind of aesthetic intellectualism that I'm trying to press forward to say these artists can be in dialogue and are in this exhibition in dialogue with artists who are academically trained. Mm -hmm. And they hold, they hold their ground and there is such a rich dialogue that an exchange that happens between these artists that um, I really am trying to find ways to elevate those practices because I think oftentimes these artists get short shift in saying that somehow there is an, an ignorance to mm -hmm. uh, or, or a lack of concern around the aesthetic mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. that there aren't um, 
very vigorous and very complex concepts they're being brought to bear in assemblage, in textiles. Um, they are actually there. And these are very, um, very complex ideas that get distilled into very simplistic forms. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't think uh, people readily recognize that. And yeah. oftentimes because of the language that we're using. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it sort of undercuts the rigor mm -hmm. and, the, and, um, and um, sort of undermines a more uh, like an intellectual and conceptual art historical approach to it by saying, oh, well, you know, it's their vision. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. Well, and because they don't use the terms and language. And, because they, it's know, a, yes. Yeah. But yeah. one could say that's true of, of Any many different, or many yeah. different cultures where yeah. um, there were encounters and because you were not utilizing the same language, somehow there was a, a sense that there was a, 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 some regression or a lack of, of uh, rigor or intellectualism or civilization in some cases about those communities when in fact they were very rich, mm -hmm. uh, a very rich and very, you know, um, in-depth uh, intellect uh, that existed years and decades and sometimes centuries prior to that encounter. That's right, mm. yeah. So the next musical bridge we encounter in the exhibition is Nadine Robinson. Although it's shown in, shown in somewhat uh, proximity to Rashad Newsom that we'll talk, I'll ask about in a minute. But, and I actually, I like that we had fun sort of balancing the sound yes. between the Nadine Robinson and the Rashad Newsom. Um, but the Nadine Robinson is a very imposing work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of, for us, the crescendo of the spirituality section. Uh, this is, of course, the Organon mm -hmm. um, uh, sculpture made of speaker boxes. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the power of this piece. Well, I mean, first thing that you encounter is the, uh, the sort of um, almost like a, a drone, uh, which is a, uh, a rhythm in which sets the tone for almost a procession. And uh, what it's rooted in, of course, are the protests, civil rights protests. And Nadine, who is so masterful at using not only sound, but also light works, but she endeavors in understanding how sound can be collaged, uh, how it can overlay. And so with that, um, she has the, the, the droning of the drum and the procession, and then you begin to hear distorted sounds, uh, almost like uh, the, the spraying of water. Um, you hear the sounds of people uh, crying out, and then you get Handel's coronation uh, choral song that happens above it, and meld it with that, the oration and the ecstatic shouts of a minister uh, in the church. So it, it really is evoking the, the um, coronation of a king, but a king uh, emerging from the midst of the civil rights. And of course, um, that is speaking to the coronation of Martin Luther King. And, uh, and so it, 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 the, the droning of the drum and the rhythm, because oftentimes he was called the drum major. Mm. And so it is mm. that kind of you know, rhythm that people would then march to. Uh, and the facade of the, the speakers, what they, how they are visually arranged, uh, really is mirroring the, the facade of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. uh, one can also see it as pipe organs and mm -hmm. these uh, beautiful cathedrals and churches, but um, she's able to bring this sound piece to us in a way that is so visceral, but beautiful and uh, full of, um, it's so uh, complex that you could literally sit in front of it, although it, it, I would wear a little muffs of ears because it's, it's rather loud. But um, it, is, it is visceral mm -hmm. and, and, and it's meant to, I don't think people quite readily understand why it's visceral and it's because she has distorted the sounds of the water cannons She's distorted the sounds of the, the, the gnarling and the growling of the dogs. She's distorted these sounds, uh, so it allows um, uh, more of a curiosity than uh, a literal translation of trauma. Mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. 
but it is completely bodily oh, yes. in that respect. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And so many of the vibrations are so low yes. that you feel them more as vibrations yes. than as sound. And you can see the speakers themselves vibrating. vibrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, from one king, Martin Luther right. King, to another, um, in the King of Arms, uh, we have uh, a transition in the exhibition from the theme of spirituality to black corporality. Yes. Um, and um, I love how you bring, pull forward very much so the argument that the black body itself is a site of consideration mm -hmm. for understanding the history of the American South. Yes, yes. I mean, it is, uh, it has been subjected. Um, it is both the object, but it's also both the agent. It's also, um, it, the black body functions as a preserver, as a repository of histories, as a repository and, and memory, muscle memories as well. So um, it has a many different layers that one can begin to look at the black body. Um, but one thing is very clear that you can't talk about the South without talking about the black body. Uh, it's an impossibility, you know. Uh, it has really reframed and defined what we understand as the South. Um, so, but, uh, you know, Rashad Newsom is really interesting and, and this is where I uh, will probably turn the mic and talk to Miranda because uh, the piece that you're seeing, King of Arms, was actually commissioned by Miranda um, when she worked at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Uh, and uh, it is a, it's a brilliant piece because it is about uh, transgression. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and a willful transgression, um, mm -hmm. and to reassert and reframe narratives in spaces, in hollow spaces, mm -hmm. and in certain um, hierarchies it, in which certain types of bodies are not always welcome. So I'm going to turn the mic for just a second and say, <laughs> well, could you talk about the commissioning <laughs> of Rashad Newsom's King of Arms for NOMA? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I first saw Rashad's work at the Whitney Biennial when he was doing this groundbreaking work on um, use, incorporating Vogue dancers. And, you know, he'd become very immersed in the New York Vogue scene. But I remember seeing on the label that he was from New Orleans, Louisiana, which I was like, wow, this artist so deeply immersed in um, the histories of New York Vogue has roots in Louisiana. Um, and so we invited Rashad um, to explore a project with us. and. To me, it was a very powerful example of an artist from a place exploring his own history and reappropriating it and making it his own. Um, so in the piece, um, Mardi Gras culture is such a huge part of New Orleans. It's, it's a season, um, but it also, I mean, really influences uh, how culture is shaped year round. And a huge part of that is because there are social uh, structures known as crews. These are club memberships. There's more than a dozen in New Orleans. Um, and they have their own uh, royalty. Um, so every crew has a king, queen, and court. Um, and there's you know famous black crews like Zulu um, that Louis Armstrong was a member of. And, um, and uh, the most uh, famous of the crews is Rex, king of carnival. But at any rate, um, Rashad took that model of royalty of the crews and the procession of Mardi Gras and really made it into his um, takeover of the New Orleans Museum of Art, um, which was significant on a lot of levels in that um, New no NOMA, New Orleans Museum of Art, was a segregated space until 1968. Um, and, you know, I remember hearing stories about how Elizabeth Catlett tried to bring um, students from Dillard and Xavier, black students, to New Orleans Museum of Art. And they put up, there was tremendous difficulty because um, there was this bizarre thing about how the park was segregated, the museum technically wasn't, so the students couldn't touch the soil of the park in order to enter the building. Um, so it was, you know, a space with a lot of um, deep, complex history. The site of the museum itself is a former plantation. And so to have Rashad come in, um, and he's a you know, queer artist, and also to bring in the history of New York Vogue into the history, meld it with the history of Mardi Gras. So you have Vogue dancers dancing with Mardi Gras Indians. You have these melding of his New York influences with his Louisiana culture. He dressed himself in a vestment with a New Orleans fleur-de-lis and a magnolia. 
and um, uh, to crown himself as king in that procession was very de deliberately, mm -hmm. as you described, an act of transgression. Mm -hmm. Like, it's my space now. All I am right. claiming it. Um, Which is really beautiful because also, you know, these crews can be very hyper-masculine as yes, well. Yes. So there are multiple layers of transgression and transgressive activities that are happening which are again about expanding and exploding these conventions and allowing new narratives to be formed within their wake. Yes. So um, I love that the, um, that the refrain that one hears, the choral that one hears is takeover, you know? Uh, and it's like, yes, it is an absolute reclaiming, a reclamation Yes, yes. And I had a colleague say, I, what is that beat? And I'm like, well, it's a hybrid of New York Vogue and New Orleans Bounce. Right. So that's probably why you don't recognize it. Right. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Um, and it's definitely because of that sound. It greets you before you see it. No. Um, so from the, the black, the theme of the black body continues onto the lower level of MCA Denver, um, where there are, there's Philandus Thames, um, Just Hangin' um, piece. And um, you know, I, I, it should be acknowledged there is this, there is a deep recognition of history of violence, um, mm. histories of violence within the exhibition, but also histories of resilience, stories yeah. of resilience, um, and uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I was just, uh, one of the overarching narratives about the South is it's, you know, the, the narrative of violence. and. Yet it, it becomes the, the overarching narrative almost to the detriment of understanding the, the persistence and resistance and the thriving of communities in the wake of the ever-present possibility of some act of violence. Like there is a, there is a defiance, like the, the idea to choose to survive. I mean, oftentimes there is this statement, of, you know, really related that we are the we are the uh, descendants of those who chose to survive. It's oftentimes uh, discussed in relation to the Atlantic slave trade, but I think it's also apt for understanding the South in a moment where any action could be seen as transgressive and, and uh, dealt with in a very swift and a very um, uh, uh, severe way. Um, oftentimes this is where lynching came from, uh, this notion that uh, and oftentimes it had nothing to do with anything transgressive other than attempting to survive and thrive as communities, mm -hmm. having businesses that were uh, doing very well, having economic independence was oftentimes seen as transgressive. And so uh, there is this notion that the mere existence and um, the insistence uh, of being present and, and being seen is, is an act of, it's considered a transgressive act. But yet and still people are, are thriving and demanding to be seen even in the wake of that. I think that's the beautiful thing. Someone asked why there was a slab in the, in the, in the exhibition, you know, this, this car, the slab. Uh, if you go to places in Houston, I think uh, I mean, pretty much now it's pretty conventional is to have these elbows on these slabs that really stick out really far. People say, well, they're loud, they're, they're, they're dangerous on the roads. I think it really is a generational response to being seen, an insistence on being seen. You will see me. I will make myself known. Mm -hmm. uh, you will hear me before you see me. Yes. <laughs> You know, and you won't get too close to me. Uh, that would be dangerous for you. You know, so mm -hmm. there's, there's this beautiful insistence. And uh, I think that's, you know, so yes, this notion that uh, somehow uh, the narrative of preservation and thriving gets lost mm -hmm. in the overarching notion of violence. Yeah. Yeah, but let's talk a, a bit about that, those inclusion of objects from material culture. Mm -hmm. And um, because one of the, the work, part of the work that this exhibition does is really discard boundaries, um, as you described before, between quote unquote academically and not academically trained artists, but also between um, objects that might be traditionally considered 
um, not works of fine art, more in the realm of um, visual culture or um, historical ephemera. And this exhibition really embraces that in a big way. And I should mention, inspired us to do um, an event with the lowrider community here in Denver, a show and shine, where we acknowledge that there are art forms, that, so many art forms that live far beyond the museum walls. Um, and they're, but they're part of the visual culture of place. Absolutely. I mean, you can't look at a slab and look at Thornton Dowell and think that they're disconnected. I mean, it is an extension of these practices that uh, are being brought to bear. It's a sensibility uh, that's being brought to bear. Uh, there are other objects that are featured in the exhibition, things that I love to call power objects. These are the residuals of uh, the residual of, of uh, a performance uh, that remains. Uh, you have the horn of or Ornette Coleman, his saxophone. You have uh, stage wear, performance wear by CeeLo Green and James Brown and the guitar used by Bo Diddley. I mean, these things still resonate with the, with the wear and the performer's breath and with their, um, the stroke of their hands, the hands being in it or their bodies uh, having exhibited inside of it, you know. It, it, it is this notion of these power objects um, you could see them, uh, some objects as talismans as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should mention that Stilo suit is quite the knockout. It is yeah. uh, head, to, uh, shoulders to toe, florals, um, completely encircling his body. Um, I could ask you this about every object in the show, but could you share a bit how, about how you landed on Stilo's suit? Well, I think Stilo, well, it's all part of the Dungeon family, but what I really loved about uh, the Dungeon family is that they were always looking for, the, some of them were, were, went to school for art, and uh, they were always looking for ways to not only distinguish themselves in a, in a very large field, and of course, at that time, it was really asserting themselves from the South uh, as distinguished from East and West Coast, but also how to distinguish themselves um, as, uh, as performers, as people who had a real sense of artistic um, uh, framing uh, that they wanted to be as sonically and visually distinctive and unique as possible. I think CeeLo Green, out of all of them, uh, has really pushed this needle as far uh, visually as I think, um, I mean, he and Missy Elliott, I think, are somehow side by side in pushing not only the sonic, but the visual manifestation of those concepts. And this was the X Factor that was uh, on television in the UK, uh, where he donned a flower suit, but he has shown up places like Metallica Man, you know, the Metal Man, I mean, he really does play a lot with uh, concealing the body uh, in ways that allows him a certain kind of freedom of being, which mm -hmm. I think is so astounding. Bless yes. you. Yeah. yeah, so the suit is on view in the Cabinet of Wonders, where there are a lot of incredible objects from musical history and work by visual artists. Um, and uh, on the other side of the wall of the Cabinet of Wonders, there are these incredible photographs by Julia Beverly and Sheila Pre Bright of luminaries from the hip hop scene yes. of the South. You know, we've got Ludacris. Um, you know, um, could could you talk a bit about those selections? Well, I yeah. I definitely wanted to give a nod to hip hop. I mean, oftentimes people see the title of the exhibition, and the assumption is that it's a show dedicated to hip hop, when in fact it's really about what Southern hip hop has allowed us to embrace. And, and, and to come back to these traditions with newfound lens. And, but I wanted to still give nod to, to this, this form, which still reverberates and has become really ubiquitous. I mean, there's no longer conversations about East and West Coast rap. It's all Southern rap at this point, you know? And um, so having those photographs, the actual documentation, and in the initial uh, iteration of this exhibit, you see this hallway of photographs. They were um, photographs of not just hip hop, but of you know the New Orleans uh, Preservation Hall and music and how uh, saloons and places where music happened. And then the other side were those documentations of contemporary Southern hip hop. So you have uh, photographers like Sheila Pre Bright, 
who were hired to document uh, and, and create commercial material for album covers. Um, they also knew the power of, of image and how to craft image for the marketing purposes. Uh, you also have people like Julia Beverly, who even now still follows hip hop um, and, and focuses on that. And she had her own uh, magazine mm -hmm. that really featured the voices of these hip hop artists and is really seen as with such high esteem by all of these artists because she really was bringing uh, their stories to a much larger, um, a larger um, uh, audience. Yeah, well, and I say I would say for some of our audiences, it's it's the it's the most immediately accessible part of the show. These are um, figures that they recognize from the world of hip hop. But I think I love that you're helping draw a line of trajectory, like let's say from Bo Diddley, through the history of American music to hip hop. Right, and it's that again that rootedness. Exactly, yeah. and, and we are dealing with a hundred years, and there have been a number of musical genres that are in beautiful dialogue. Uh, with, with the visual material culture that comes from, from the same roots. Uh, so you see things like spirituals, and when you look at like a G's Ben quilt, to know that some of the quilters that were involved were also part of the White Rose Quartet, which were a, a, a singing quartet that moved in and around the South. Um, Mildred Thompson's wit picture was also involved in music and was part of the band. Romir Bearden himself was a pianist, a mathematician, but also one that we recognize widely for his iconic collage work. So there are a lot of tie-ins. Nathaniel Donay, who has the side of the shotgun shack, is also a drummer. So there's a lot of evocation of sound in the work, uh, but then people who are also practicing on both sides of the sonic and the visual, and they both inform one another. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question, and then I'd love to open it up yes. uh, for others to ask theirs. Um, so a year ago, we were, uh, my director Nora and I were talking about like, how will the Dirty South be received in the mountains west? How is it going to live in this space? And um, I will say after experiencing last night, which was one of, which was certainly our most well attended opening since COVID, um, but just very well attended in general, it seemed to answer that question resoundingly of whether this story will find resonance in regions mm -hmm. far beyond the south. Um, we are the only non-southern venue. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'd really, you know, as I guess as my last question, I'd like to sort of open it up to like, what does this discourse mean, you know, to the, to the country and even internationally? What does it mean to bring forward this, these stories of the South? Well, it's South to America. I mean, again, you know, South is a point of origin. And I, I think the conversations that happen there um, are very much relevant. I mean, it wasn't just African-Americans who migrated out of the South. People migrated, communities migrated out of the South. And so there, uh, there still are spaces in which people see themselves reflected. It, it may have its um, rootedness in, in the geography of the South, but these are also very much universal stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was speaking to someone the other day, that side of a shotgun shack may be a remnant of African architecture in the Southern landscape but there are very few cultures who don't have um, some version of the shotgun shack in their own uh, historical arc. And so these are universal stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'd now love to give folks an opportunity from the audience if you have questions for the illustrious Valerie Cassell Oliver. Wow. Hi. Hi. My mom and I went to um, Bentonville just to see this exhibit. It was amazing, oh. and I can't wait to see it again at the MCA. Um, so how, besides just the space constraints, does the exhibit change, or the venue change the exhibit? <laughs> does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I mean, every venue that it's traveled. I think like what you're seeing here, Storm in Time of Shelter, uh, had a large footprint. So this is a work that did not travel at all. Um, each venue had its own architecture. And so uh, some works would travel there, others would not. 
Um, but what I love and what I love about the uh, MCA is how each venue, still adhering to these sections, will have different configurations of artists in conversation with one another. So it may not have been the initial iteration of how it was presented in Virginia, but of course, it, it offers something even new for me as I walk through these spaces and I see new juxtapositions of an artist who's now in direct dialogue visually with another artist that may have been in a different room. And so it, it is really wonderful to see uh, the things that come to the fore as it shifts and changes from one space and architecture to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Absolutely. This was the most wonderful show that I have seen in a very long time. And Thank it you. excited me so much that I am just thrilled to can be an artist. But I wanted to know, <clears throat> based on the last question, how many artists were not represented in MCA? And if the catalog represents those artists as well. Yes, the catalog uh, presents all of the artists in the exhibition. There were initially 102 artists, and at the MCA there's 90. So there are 12 artists who are not represented, uh, some of which have been previously presented right. at the MCA. So there were some hard and fast choices to make. Jason Moran, for instance, was one of the artists in the exhibit, but you were just regaled with his amazing work here. Nari Ward uh, is another artist, uh, Paul Stephen Benjamin. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of artists who had previous presences here, uh, Arthur Jaffa, um, that were in the original iteration, but not in this particular presentation. Yeah, it was a hard call, but we did, um, as you said, Valerie, like because we knew we had to edit in terms of space, there were certain artists who had, had recent solo presentations. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, so I too saw this at Crystal Bridges, which also another wonderful Thank installation. You. Uh, but thinking about the space and architecture of the spaces and how it changes, the two works that like have affected me most were Rashad Newsom and Bethany Collins' uh, Lost Friends series. But I realized that both those pieces were very close to each other in both spaces. Can you talk about the relationship that you see between those two? Between Bethany Collins and? Rashad Newsom. Mm. Can I talk about the, forgive me? I uh, like the relationship to them because like in Crystal Bridges and here they're within about 10 feet of each other. So I was curious about how, if there is a relationship you saw between the two. Between the two, um, Rashad Newsom and Bethany Collins. What I will say about the Bethany Collins work is it is um, in its very difficult uh, way, it's making us work to understand history uh, in the sense that it's a black on black embossed work um, of uh, recreation of ads that were taken out uh, of people searching for their loved ones in the aftermath of the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's a lesser known history. It's something um, that we don't think often about, uh, what happened to these communities in the aftermath of, of being freed from bondage. Oftentimes people didn't even move because there was nowhere for them to go. Where were they gonna go? This is all they ever knew. Uh, there were people who did uh, stay in place because they were hoping to be reunited with loved ones who had been sold away. Uh, and so those ads were taken and those were the Mississippi edition uh, of people looking for loved ones. And so their ads searching for siblings and for husbands and for wives. And I think with Rashad, I, I would say maybe it's also calling attention to um, these lesser known traditions and the intricacies of things. It's bringing, as Miranda said, light into the histories of things that we don't always understand, that uh, museums throughout the South, and I don't wanna just uh, single out the South, 
because segregation uh, happened in many forms throughout the United States. But to, to know that Southern museums followed the conventions, the so, social conventions of their day. So if it was a segregated community, museums were segregated. And the fact that as late as 1968, um, the, the NOMA was not, uh, that was still segregated. So I would say if there's dialogue, it is really casting a light on these uh, little known histories that still, I think, have an impact on this. Um, Currently, yeah. Yeah. you're welcome. A couple of questions. I have not seen the exhibit. I'm very excited about seeing it. But I, I saw the promotion for the event that's taking the showcase that's taking place next week, mm -hmm. and wanted to to ask a question about how the artists that are participating in that showcase. Um, how did you choose them and their works and how does it relate to the, the art pieces that are showcased? And number two, how did you choose Denver as the, the non-Southern um, location and your last location for the exhibit? Well, I'll let Miranda speak to the showcase. Sure. Um, and how it relates to the exhibition. I, every venue will produce its own programming um, that really speaks to community and, and how to really sort of allow uh, different elements in the community. It's an opportunity to partner in many ways. So I'll let her speak to that. Um, when you generate an exhibition, um, you're hoping that the world will want to see it. Um, but oftentimes that means that institutions have to step forward to say we want this exhibition for our community. We want to bring it here. Um, it ain't free, <laughs> so number one. <laughs> so people have to commit resources to bringing these, uh, this exhibition. Uh, it's a huge undertaking you know, to devote the whole of the building to one exhibition. Um, it, we knew that um, the exhibition would travel. We were delighted that uh, Nora uh, came and saw with Miranda the exhibition and they immediately committed the institution to bringing it. Um, the show opened in May of 2021 and there are some objects, as you know, that are not in the exhibition, but there are objects that cannot uh, for its own safety travel for long stretches of time. So there is a bookend of how long a show can actually be um, held together and, and moved around the country. So for my museum, we really ceiling the venues at four. And this was the fourth venue, so it's the fourth and final venue. And I was really delighted that it's an institution that sits outside of the South because I myself had a real um, sense of curiosity uh, whether the, the themes or the ideas uh, presented would be embraced and, and understood in, a, in, a, in the way that I intended um, for spaces outside of, of the Southern USA. Sure, so um, we have an incredible programming department at MCA Denver uh, with uh, Christina Chambers, Sarah Kate Bai, and Mike Sabrinik. So I'm not trying to punt the question to them, but I am point, punting the question to them of the selection of the artists in the musical showcase. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're going to make me talk. Oh, I'm so far. Hi, I'm sorry. Hi. Oh, <laughs> I did not intend to talk on a microphone today. Um, my name is Christina Chambers. I'm the assistant director for programming. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. You have to turn around. Um, uh, in planning all the programs uh, around this exhibition, I wanted to be very intentional about the themes of the exhibition. Also, the themes that were covered within the book. Um, that's that you should really buy the catalog. Um, I wanted, I also was very intentional about, um, I wanted, specifically for the showcase, I wanted black folks. I wanted black folks who performed and I wanted black folks who had some sort of connection to the South. So our host for the evening is um, Dominique Christina. She's a local poet, musician, author, but she has many ties to the South and she actually helped us curate that event specifically with other performers. Um, and I don't want to give too much away because there is some 
surprises, if you will. Um, but you really should come next Saturday and check it out. So, yeah, I love it. And and you know, for you know, there's the sonic and there's the visual arts, but there's so many different arts that that really comprise what we understand as Southern culture. Um, cuisine, I had the lovely uh, opportunity to meet uh, Adrian Miller, who mm -hmm. is a food historian that's right here in Denver. Uh, and he will be speaking and, and, yes. uh, as well. Yes. So I was just yeah. really delighted that you have these particular resources here in your community uh, to highlight um, you yeah. know, some things that the book uh, and the exhibition really do not touch upon, but are really integral to what we understand as Southern culture. Absolutely, part of that diaspora. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, from Houston, transplant from Denver, okay. back to Houston, back to Denver. And I was so excited to see all the Houston connections. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question, I have so many. Can we go to lunch? No, I'm just kidding. Um, African spirituality, um, that piece, how did you tie it in? And then, then was there a specific thought about where each piece was located? So Dubale was located in one spot, the conjuring table, and then when you think of the slave and the water, Imoja. So how did you place all of those? Was that intentional or is it just, again, the building and it ended there because of the way the building is shaped. Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think there is intentionality, but there's also uh, a response to how things can live uh, in terms of objects and space. Uh, I like to say it's part of our conjuring as yes. curators. <laughs> and um, Miranda and the team were so amazing to uh, install this exhibition in such a beautiful way. And so for me, my home is in Virginia. Uh, that is the space that I know. And so a lot of it is giving deference to Miranda to understand the layout of the architecture of the MCA and finding ways into which to retain the narrative, but do so in ways that also uh, allows her creative um, uh, brilliance to shine through as well. So it's, it's a real collaboration mm -hmm. when exhibitions go on the road, um, how they are in situ in different venues. Uh, part of it is a practicality and part of it is a creative uh, aspect to it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think above all, you want to honor the spirit of uh, the, the themes, the messages of the show. So that's your North Star. That's your gut. You know, that's what has to be done. And it's a dialogue. We sh so we create things called floor plans, which are like these diagrams of where all the artwork is going to live. We send them to Valerie because we want to make sure that, you know, we are honoring the spirit and intention of the project. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, as Valerie said, there's some, there's just, some magic that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, visual relationships and, and practical concerns too about like height, scale, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and to that end, I do, since we're at the close, I want to thank Miranda for her expert eye and for the team uh, at the MCA that were just, first of all, it's again a Herculean undertaking. Uh, and uh, such a great team and such a beautiful eye and it was been, it's been really lovely working with you on this project and I hope that you really appreciate the fruits of the labor and um, thank you again for hosting this exhibition and bringing it to life here in Denver. So. Well, we are honored and I want everyone to join me in thanking you, Valerie Cassell Oliver, for bringing us Dirty South. <laughs> monumental. We'll take good care of it. Excellent. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming. I hope yes. you have a great rest of your Saturday.